Hello and welcome to this very short talk that is provided by Kurt Garloff and me, Marius Feldmann. During this talk that is titled Digital Sovereignty, Why Open Infrastructure Matters, we would like to shed some light on the term digital sovereignty, which is currently intensively discussed in IT industry in Europe. And on the other hand, we would like to interlink the goal of um, well, digital sovereignty with open infrastructure projects. But before we do this, let's have a clear differentiation of terms. And um, well, we want to use this differentiation to clearly point out that um, digital sovereignty is not about digital outer key. Sometimes these terms are confused and are mixed up. Um, however, it's very important to differentiate this, this. So it's not about building up a wall, for example, around Europe and to keep all the nice, interesting ideas, nice concepts and specifically also existing um, nice technology outside of Europe and do everything on our own here. But it's about integrating these things into an overall ecosystem. So digital sovereignty then in the end is integrating these things, but adding also own solutions, for example, in order to have really the freedom of choice among different options that exist. The core question here is if, well, digital sovereignty means having the freedom of choice, what are essential preconditions to achieve this? Preconditions obviously are there should be alternatives available. Well, actually, if you do not have alternatives, you have no freedom of choice. That's quite obvious. Apart from this, the alternatives really have to differ, which means, well, they have some functional and non-functional properties that are different, so that differ from each other. And apart from this, this is the last aspect that is absolutely fundamental. Um, we need some means and possibilities to discover the digital services that are offers ba offered based on their properties. To give a simple example, well, if for example, somebody offers a super secure digital service or a very um, sustainable economically as well as ecologically or sustainable service, then it should be possible to discover it for sure. So these aspects, among others, have gained momentum in Europe and are currently intensively discussed. Specifically, they are also discussed in an overall interesting project scope, which is named Gaia X. Gaia X is a project that has been initiated by the German Ministry for Economy and um, Energy back in 2019. And um, currently, hundreds of um, companies, not only European ones, but companies from all around the world, work actually on that project in order to push forward the overall vision of digital sovereignty. In the next step, I would like to give a short insight, a very short overview of this Gaia-X project. In order to do so, I've taken this image from the so-called technical architecture documents that has been published in June 2020 by the German Ministry for Economy and Energy. On this image, you'll find the broad spectrum that Gaia-X covers. So on one hand, the goal is to establish a data ecosystem and on the other hand, an infrastructure ecosystem. Both of these ecosystems should be heavily interlinked and centered around different technical and non-technical solutions um, that well fall to different categories such as identity and trust, sovereign data exchange, compliance, as well as a so-called federated catalog. If you would like to uh, get any details on that, well, I recommend to read the technical architecture document. Um, however, we want to focus very briefly on this federated catalog. So uh, this catalog is ex exactly one of the solutions in order to achieve digital sovereignty as this federated catalog intends to hold so-called self-descriptions. So self-descriptions are descriptions of functional and non-functional properties apart from other aspects um, that um, are provided, for example, for digital services or for data and that are published via this federated catalog. And then users have the possibility to search for services, for example, via this federated catalog and consume them in the next step. So as I've mentioned, this is one of the core components that address the um, digital sovereignty in regards to uh, the definition that we have discussed beforehand. So with this, I want to leave the Gaia-X project behind with, well, one central aspect that I still want to point out, and uh, this is a quote from page 25 that you find in this uh, technical architecture document. The quote is, a strong open infrastructure ecosystem is a foundation of div digital sovereignty. The interesting part is that there's absolutely no explanation for this statement within the um, technical architect architecture document. 
So, well, it's on the reader's side to give an interpretation and this is exactly what we will do during the next minutes. However, before we start to really interrelate open infrastructure and digital sovereignty, let's have a brief look at the current situation and the overall future situation that we predict. So, um, here on this slide you see on top a single cloud provider, so we are ex over exaggerating a little bit the current situation. You see a single cloud provider that is operating a set of services. And this single cloud provider has some specific um, provider properties, so some characteristics such as, well, its energy efficiency, the fact um, if this cloud provider is GDPR compliant or if it is not GDPR compliant and all such things. Actually, these properties are the foundation for several such properties also on the service level, which means that these properties are partially or completely reflected on the service level as well. Which means in the end, if you only have one cloud provider, well, then there is also no diversity on the service side in regards to these properties. This can be only achieved if you have several cloud providers and have several, well, private or also public infrastructure providers uh, underneath these services having different pro um, properties in place. So this means that these provider properties, as we have just called them here, have a huge impact on the properties that um, the services that are offered have got. So specifically, for example, centered around GDPR compliance, energy efficiency, or the used hardware, maybe to add some additional things, for example, also specific security means or something like this, this that um, a specific provider has in place. These things are then reflected on the service level. What does it mean? Well, this means if we do not have several providers, if we do not have a decentralized setup where there exists different providers, well, then we will not have digital sovereignty based on what we have discussed before. Actually, we have mentioned that in order to achieve digital sovereignty, meaning to have the freedom of choice, you need alternatives that really differ. So if there is not a specific threshold reached um, in regards to how these things differ, well, then there is no digital sovereignty in place. And this, as a consequence, means we need also heterogeneous decentralized infrastructures where the providers, the private infrastructures have properties in place that really make a difference. So only then you have really a freedom of choice, thus you have then only an option for digital sovereignty. This means we can formulate a thesis here, future digital infrastructures are not monolithic and centralized but highly distributed and heterogeneous regarding their properties. And this exactly, based on the definition that we have provided before, forms the fundament in order to achieve digital sovereignty. So on this slide you see how this may look like. So, for example, here we assume a highly synergetic digital infrastructure that consists of several digital infrastructure units or different sites that um, are in a synergetic relation to their environments, more specifically to assets that are available already. So for example, it may be that there is a district heating system, it may be that there are renewable energy um, sites and um, the digital infrastructure units, they are in synergy with these existing um, assets. And on top of these digital infrastructure units, then a cloud infrastructure is for example operated that is leveraged and these different sites then have quite unique characteristics in this specific example, for example, in regards to uh, their energy efficiency. This may look like the pictures that you see here, so just some sketches to point out how this may be materialized. For example, well, the uh, digital infrastructure unit directly next door to a wind park or to a solar, solar farm in order to, uh, well, then have um, cheap and renewable energy available in orbit order to operate these digital infrastructure units. To sum up, this means that we are thinking digital infrastructures of the future as decentralized infrastructures with several sites where there are also uh, several providers behind this that operate these infrastructures and for sure all of them will have their own solutions in the first place for setting up this infrastructure and for operating this infrastructure. So where is the downside of this perspective? So we can identify two general drawbacks here. First of all, the first drawback is related to the APIs. So it may be for sure that each of these providers 
offers a different API in, in future. So if we have, for example, as here, three different providers, then we have three different APIs that are handed over to those that um, want to run services on top. And again, we end up in a vendor lock-in situation. So the situation has not improved at all. The other aspect is related to the platform that is used. So it may be that, well, each of these providers leverages a different platform. Even if these platforms that are used in order to operate this cloud infrastructure or digital infrastructure may be based on an open infrastructure project, this um, may still be an issue as, for example, this open infrastructure um, projects may be adapted or changed a little bit so that, again, it's a sort of own solution. And this is the reason why I have, I have mentioned in order to over exaggerate things a little bit on that slide um, that these providers have a proprietary cloud platform in place. So in the end, what we can see here is that um, having this future perspective means also, if we do not, well, um, change anything, um, that we have three times the development effort for creating an operational system, even if it's based on an open infrastructure project or a set of projects. Plus, we also have, as we have just discussed with regards to the API, a vendor login situation. So in order to solve this issue, we could just easily claim that there should be a standardized API for all these providers on one hand, and on the other hand, we should just um, request a single platform that should be used or uh, demand a single platform that is used in order to uh, operate um, the different um, provider infrastructures. Well, this sounds like a slight contradiction, right? On one hand, we are saying that future digital infrastructures should be heterogeneous in order to really have alternatives available due to the different properties. And on the other hand, we are requesting standards, standards for the API as well as for the platform itself. So does it make sense? Well, actually, we should not mix up things. We should really take care about what we are talking. And when talking about standardizing things, we are actually talking about a specific layer. This specific layer is providing virtual machines, virtual block devices, virtual networks and all these things. But in the end, this layer is providing commodity. And actually, it does not make sense to have many alternatives on this layer. Thus, well, standardizing things pretty much makes sense. To really demonstrate this with reference to the image that we have used before. So here in this image, you see this commodity layer visualized between the services and the infrastructure itself. And if we have a look at the provider properties or infrastructure properties again that affect as well the service properties, as explained before, well, the commodity layer doesn't make any difference in regard to these properties. So for example, if you have a very energy efficient provider or if you have a provider that leverages specific hardware or if you have a provider that is located in a specific country, all these things are directly reflected on the service layer without any impact from the commodity layer. For sure this is a slight simplification, so it may be that some specific adaptations to this commodity layer may be made that then have definitely an impact on the properties on the service um, layer. However, in general this commodity layer should have as little impact on the properties as possible. And due to this, this commodity layer is a perfect area, a perfect field in order to have generic projects in place that solve actually the technical issues on this layer. So in the end, the commodity layer should leverage open infrastructure projects to render possible, possible collaborative development and to avoid API fragmentation. So to sum that up, we can point out that open infrastructure is bridging the chasm on the commodity layer. Thus, well, the wheel should not be reinvented, actually. And to uh, point out the core findings now, well, on the path towards digital serenity is absolutely crucial to provide a modular open infrastructure solution that renders it possible to enable var various actors to uh, set up an operational platform for hosting services quickly, on one hand. And on the other hand, open infrastructure projects should reduce development overhead and should ensure API interoperability in order to avoid specifically vendor lock-in, uh, which would contradict the freedom of choice. With this short summary of the first part of the talk, 
I would like to hand over to Kurt Garloff, who now will introduce a very concrete project, the so-called Sovereign Cloud Stack, that materializes actually these findings that we have just pointed out. Thanks, Marius. My name is Kurt Garloff, and I'm going to share a bit of information on the Sovereign Cloud Stack. So what is it? Sovereign Cloud Stack is a project uh, in GaiaX, and it provides uh, what Marius just referred to as the commodity layer. So we are all about providing infrastructure software to ensure their sovereign infrastructure in GaiaX. We provide a complete open source cloud software stack. And when I say open, we really subscribe to the four opens of the open infrastructure community. We do provide a lot of infrastructure software, such as virtualization of storage uh, using Ceph, virtualization of networking, um, compute virtualization, obviously, uh, based on open source technology. Uh, we have a significant amount of operations tooling, tools for doing CI, for automating deployments, for automating updates, um, monitoring. Um, so on top, we put an infrastructure as a service layer, uh, using OpenStack for that. Um, we have a Kubernetes as a service layer on top of that. And when I say Kubernetes as a service, I do that uh, on purpose. It's not just containers as a service, but we do provide customers the ability to provision themselves via an API, via a standard interface, a Kubernetes cluster, and then control the lifecycle of that. We have some tooling around the containers, which you expect in the container space, as well as identity and access management a solution in place that allows you to federate with other clouds uh, of similar nature. The stack is complete, but it's also modular. That means if you're an existing provider and you don't want to use the complete full SCS stack, but uh, want to stay on tools that you already have deployed on pieces uh, that you already have, you can do so and only consume some of the SCS modules. To make uh, sure that we deliver on interoperability, that we really are compatible, at this commodity layer, we do have strong standards, so stronger than what you are used to see from the OpenStack community. We really want to make sure that if you're using several SCS-based clouds, uh, you will have no trouble at all to move applications from one to the other or to use several at the same time and not even notice the difference. Um, and those standards really do not end at the API layer, but we really want to define also the behavior and also um, certain aspects of how those clouds are being operated. Uh, and those standards are being certifiable, so you can actually prove as a provider to your customers that you adhere to those standards. Um, we have federation built in by design uh, and compatibility that I just talked about is just one aspect of that. Identity federation is an important one because you don't want to manage your users and the access rights that go along with that on each cloud separately. You want to be able to do it once and then define this for all of your clouds that you're using. And of course, you do need a uh, network connectivity between those clouds. You want to have the ability to create secure tunnels or secure connections with the bandwidth and uh, latency requirements that you have. Uh, finally, we're spending significant effort to actually work with the operators, support them, uh, to really build an ecosystem out of them uh, and we want to make sure that we extend the idea of working together according to the four opens in building software, also in sharing operational knowledge and really make sure that the providers open up and learn from each other and don't need to solve those same hard and difficult problems that you really see in day-to-day -day operations uh, independently, each of them. So we really want to make sure there's a network of providers also working together at this base. Um, commodity layer that Marius was talking about. And this helps uh, to improve the quality and also to make the quality more transparent to users. This is um, a slightly different picture than uh, Marius showed that uh, gives you an idea how the Gaia-X ecosystem is being looked at. At the bottom layer, you see the, the infrastructure ecosystem, and this is where the Sovereign Cloud Stack um, provides an option for providers to have sovereign infrastructure. Um, talking about where we are with our project, it's a really young project. We only started uh, somewhat less than a year ago when we first came together and had this idea. It was initially initiated by a group of members of the Open Source Business Alliance. This is a, an alliance of um, German-speaking countries, uh, open source companies that 
really work together there to kind of uh, define their common interest. Um, we have built a very small team uh, based on this um, idea. Um, and that team, really consisting out of a handful of people, is now coordinating and orchestrating a much larger community of contributors, contributors from companies where IT departments work with us because they're interested, but also existing and uh, new cloud providers that uh, are interested in contributing to this effort. Uh, we have been lucky to receive some funding from the uh, agency for disruptive innovation in Germany for this year and we're also currently working towards a larger funding proposal that we are trying to to get funding uh, for the next years and um, I'm very optimistic this works out um, very importantly we have a significant number of companies and partners that are supporting us uh, not just from the open source business alliance but also um, various companies from the industry as well as um, uh, cloud providers. Uh, we have uh, companies from Sweden and France that have joined us and are supporting us. Uh, we do have a trademark, we have a logo, we have a web page, uh, we have um, open source code available on GitHub. Um, we're part of the GaiaX uh, community. Uh, we're also working with uh, supporting the uh, foundation that's being built up in the GaiaX uh, ecosystem. Uh, and SCS is established as an official work package in GaiaX. Uh, we do talk a lot to people in the industry, uh, but we also received some very positive feedback from actually companies that support IT in the public sector. And we've also recently had quite a bit of coverage from press, mostly in Germany. Um, and I have to say that was really motivating and positive because people seem to um, have the impression that what we are doing is really something that needs to be done. So we are happy to be there. Uh, on the technical side, we have worked quite a bit on already providing uh, technology so we have code out there and that code can be used already so uh, we can do deployments uh, fully automated with uh, the available code so we have been successful integrating all these uh, existing open source projects in an automated way uh, validating them and uh, making them available we can do bare metal installations obviously there's a few steps in a bare metal installation that are not fully automated because you need to do uh, the, the cabling and put those machines in the rack. Uh, but once you've done all that, uh, you can actually uh, do it fully automatically. Uh, but also very nice for testing, for validation, also for demos, is that we can actually deploy on top of an existing infrastructure as a service uh, solution uh, using Terraform. So we can actually put um, the server in cloud stack, which includes OpenStack, on top of an existing OpenStack deployment. And that takes between one hour or maybe 90 minutes, depends a bit on the network uh, connection and performance of your environment. Um, that is very useful. We have that running at uh, more than half a dozen cloud providers. We also have two where we actually have already uh, physical installations. Um, finally, the container layer, the Kubernetes layer is something we're currently still working on. We're struggling a bit with it, to be very honest, uh, because the um, Kubernetes cluster API uh, does not seem to have adopted and matured as much as we would like. And this is kind of preventing us from coming up with a final standardized solution in that space. So we're working with the SAP Gardner folks, with the Kubernetes folks, uh, with Rancher. We, we have been talking to, to Giant Swarm to see that we can work together. Um, but we still need to, to kind of define this common standard to really uh, uh, get a breakthrough in that area. This is a short look at the architecture, which I will basically skip to avoid running out of time. That being said, let me summarize. Um, Marius, I think, has very well explained that sovereignty is important and that it matters. Uh, in order to achieve it, you need to have choice, you need to have control. So we need to make sure we have a diverse, decentralized ecosystem for providing open cloud infrastructure. Um, right now, we have somewhat of a fragmentation that really is not helpful. If solutions that are open are incompatible to each other, uh, that does not help. And the second observation we have is that it's very hard to provide a high quality operations of cloud infrastructure. So SCS is trying to help this with standardizing, uh, making sure we uh, make the operations a lot easier and with also making sure that all these infrastructures that are based on SCS are compatible to each other. Um, that's it. Um, I want to invite you to join the two SCS sessions that we have today. There's one at uh, a quarter past noon. Uh, and there's one on Wednesday morning, 9.15 at Central European time. Um, I have provided three links to uh, 
that you can go to to get further information and I would be happy if you join our team and support us uh, developing this project. Thanks for your attention. If you have any questions to Marius or myself, please uh, ask.